In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Well, good evening. Welcome back to our parish mission. Uh, today, you have an opportunity to obtain a plenary indulgence. A plenary indulgence is granted to the faithful who, on the occasion of a mission, have heard some of the sermons and are present for the solemn conclusion of the mission. So the solemn conclusion of the mission is tomorrow. And a partial indulgence is granted to the faithful who assist with attention and devotion at other occasions of the preaching of the Word of God. So that's at a parish mission, but there is also... So by hearing the conference, the preaching tonight, and attendance of the Mass tonight, and the coming to the conclusion of the mission tomorrow, you can gain a plenary indulgence. But also... Let's see here if I can find this for you. Um, well, I know I looked it up the other day. Well, you also get a plenary indulgence for coming to a Eucharistic Congress, also known as a Eucharistic Conference, as we are having here. And I can't find it here. Uh, Okay, well, you don't need to wait while I look this up. We'll go with uh, listening to a, uh, a sermon, a preaching, a conference here at the parish mission, and uh, attending the solemn conclusion tomorrow, you can gain a plenary indulgence. Now, you can gain a plenary indulgence on any day for uh, spending a half hour praying before the Blessed Sacrament outside of Mass, for spending a half hour reading from the Holy Scriptures devoutly, prayerfully, or praying a rosary in public. Those are all things you can also do to gain a plenary indulgence every day. But for the gaining of the plenary indulgence today, let us... Oh, here we are. Uh, plenary Indulgences, Eucharistic Congress. Oh, here it is, page 49. This is what I originally told you you could make one for today. There we are. Tonight we have as our speaker, uh, Father Frederick Gruber from the Archdiocese or Diocese? From the Diocese of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He is a parish chaplain of 12 nursing homes. And he, uh, in, in Monroe, Monroeville? Monroeville, Pennsylvania. As an aside, before I introduce him, however, we're going to have two confessors listening to confessions only of the altar boys, only of the altar boys during the conference, and then during the Mass, we'll have com someone hearing confessions for everyone else. So this is the, the only opportunity for the altar boys to all get into their confessions before the Mass. So if you'll just leave this time for the altar boys. We have Father Spearing on this side, Father Erlen Bush. Once the altar boys are done, the confessions are over. And then there'll be another confessor coming to hear confessions during the Mass. Well, let us welcome uh, Father Frederick Gruber then, uh, speaking on the virtue of prudence. And he will lead you in the prayers for the gaining of the indulgence. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Virgin most prudent, pray for us. Saint Joseph most prudent, pray for us. Saint John Vianney, pray for us. Saint Dominic, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do good and avoid evil. This was the advice my dear uncle would give to my brothers and sisters and me. Do good and avoid evil, he would say as he would leave, drawing from his uh, Benedictine uh, rule of St. Benedict. and He was in that way covered. No matter whatever else we did, if it was wrong, he could have said, I, I told you so. Do good and avoid evil. What didn't you understand? This is the first basic principle of uh, the moral life. Do good and avoid evil. But if it were just that, then my, my conference could be very short, the shortest of them all. But we do have air conditioning and we have some time, so we can unfold this somewhat more. There are further principles of the, the moral life, secondary principles reflections based off of this. And this pertains to prudence. To discuss prudence this evening, I'd like to consider what it is, why we have it, why we seek it, how it is used, and who uses it. St. Peter writes in his second epistle, Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these things are yours and abound, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How striking that is, ineffective or unfruitful. We don't want to be that. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, he who abides in me will bear much fruit. He expects of us fruitfulness in the spiritual life. And so we must do more than have faith. We must supplement that with knowledge, with virtue, and self-control, as St. Peter says. That virtue, that knowledge, is especially about prudence, what we should be doing. The Church has defined prudence as right reason in our actions, discerning good and evil, to know what good to do, what evil to avoid. In order for us to come to to, uh, to have prudence, St. Thomas Aquinas explains the secondary universal principles, those things coming from after do good, avoid evil, the secondary universal principles of the practical reason are not inherited from nature. We're not born with them. Little children don't know them naturally. They don't immediately know about what it is to do good. They don't know immediately, obviously, inherently, innately what evil to avoid. But these are acquired by discovery through experience or through teaching. First, by discovery through experience. St. Thomas Aquinas puts this as one of the first parts of prudence, memory, that we have experiences that we can learn from. That's secondary, to, to have understanding of them. Part of the reason why a young man cannot yet be prudent is that he doesn't yet have enough experience. He's not made enough mistakes, he's not had enough success. So we need to learn from, from elders. St. Thomas Aquinas says in this regard, 
Prudence is concerned with particular matters of action, and since such matters are of infinite variety, no man can consider them all sufficiently, nor can this be done quickly, for it requires length of time. Hence, in matters of prudence, man stands in very great need of being taught by others, especially by old folk who have acquired a sane understanding of the ends in practical matters. Wherefore, the philosopher says, it is right to pay no less attention to the undemonstrated assertions and opinions of such persons as are experienced, older than we are, and prudent than to their demonstrations, for their experience gives them ins an insight into principles. Part of the reason for our gathering as priests for annual conference of the priestly fraternity of St. Joseph is just for this reason, to share insights from developed prudence, to learn from our elders, to be docile to the tradition, to learn what have, has been the best practices when it comes to the practice of the liturgy and in various matters of pastoral wisdom. In a way, this is almost guaranteed to occur, even when we're in an era when many of the older generation haven't been in a lifelong pursuit of wisdom, through the ups and downs of life, through experience, they tend to gather a bit of wisdom. Reminded of a dear old lady who's over a hundred years old now, I was sitting with her at the nursing home a couple months ago, and I shared with her a prayer card of the Divine Mercy. And I pointed it out to her, and in case her old eyes could no longer even read the large print, I pointed out the caption. It says, Mary, here, Jesus, I trust in you. And dear old Mary said, well, who else are you going to trust? Indeed. She knew that clearly. And it was not only the point of it, but the clarity and forcefulness of it that was so instructive. It was so refreshing. She saw that clearly from her years, decades of experience. We use prudence, we don't use the word prudence very much nowadays. We use it in, uh, in different kind of uh, synonyms, though. We call it common sense. And we lament that common sense is lacking. Well, this takes some effort, some purpose, some docility, some reflection and understanding. We might call it strategic planning, like a strategy in business or in war. Our Lord seems to speak about prudence in that regard. He compares the, the kingdom of heaven to the sacrifices needed for entering the kingdom of heaven as a, like a man, like a king, about to go to make war against another king. Would he not first sit down and think whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that with 20,000 comes after against him? Or else, while the other is yet far off, sending an embassy, he desires conditions of peace. So we're taught to seek prudence to consider these matters of planning from the gospel itself. Our Lord in, in, in Sunday's gospel, the dishonest steward, spoke of the children of this world are wiser or more prudent in their generation than the children of light. Because we're not looking at the big picture, we're not looking to, to heaven. So we seek to develop prudence. Another term for it is a time management about when we do things. It is said that all sin is a matter of imprudence. All sin is a waste of time, a poor use of time. And all of the following of the commandments are following matters of prudence. All of the Decalogue is prudential points about how we must live. All the Ten Commandments are demanded by, by sound prudence. 
This is not merely some invasion of uh, Greek philosophy into the Christian life. This was something that was integral in the experience of the uh, of even the people of God of the Old Covenant. In the wisdom literature, we have uh, prudence named. We have uh, the the four cardinal virtues as specified in the uh, the book of wisdom chapter 8 wisdom of solomon chapter 8 verse 7 And if anyone loves righteousness, her labors are virtues, for she teaches self-control and prudence, justice and courage. Nothing in life is more profitable for men than these. A rather strong endorsement from sacred scripture, from the inspired word of God, from the Holy Spirit, Nothing in life is more profitable for men than these. Self-control, temperance, and prudence, justice, and courage. So we seek to live out these principles of prudence that we would live a better life. St. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Prudence, then, is about seeking what is God's will for us in this particular situation, in each circumstance in our lives. St. Ambrose would put it this way, that prudence is the font of duty. We speak about being holy by doing the duties of your state in life. And some of these are are quite obvious, but figuring out when these must be done, how these must be done, how to fit it into our schedule, this is the effort of prudence. Consider an example. We know that parents are first teachers of the faith for their children. In general, some point along the way, and at various points along the way, a father must, in raising his children, impart to them the faith. That's the general principle. Prudence would prompt him to reflection, consideration of his own time, the schedule, the needs of his children, his capacities. So he might delegate a significant portion of that to a good catechetical program. An unfortunate folly of the mid-20th century Catholicism was an over-delegation even unto abdication of the work of parents in passing on the faith. So we might realize that it's necessary for him as a good father to impart the faith to his children by a distinct time of teaching them lessons from the catechism. Well, that would be a further prudential consideration, but it would go further still Well, when would he do that? It might be, considering the needs of the family schedule, that he ought to do that on Thursdays at 6.15 p.m., or maybe 6.15 a.m., but however it would be, that would be down to a particular consideration of when it would be most opportune. And then if he were to purposely neglect that, what he had prudently considered, because prudence and conscience are very much related, and that could be a matter of venial sin. And if he purposely disregarded it many times over the course of months and years, then he could hardly say, oh, I was going to catch up with giving them a crash course when they turned 17 and try to impart the faith to them by that point. So prudence helps us to take a general principle, doing the good, teach the faith, impart that to your children, 
to down to a catechal, catechal lesson on the meaning of the resurrection on uh, Tuesday, April 17th at 6.15 p.m. Something like that. It can be getting down to that kind of particulars that could be flowing from a wholesome, prayerful consideration of prudence. Lots of times in uh, ancient councils and ecclesiastical documents, they will speak of legislation and then some things left up to the sound judgment, the reasoning, and the prudence of bishops. In years gone by, such was a form of governance in the church that although a pope would give a, a, a law, a council would make a decision, even on matters of discipline, a bishop would have the uh, authority to uh, discern in prudence how it would apply in his diocese, and uh, a pastor would have responsibilities of prudence for, uh, for following through in his own parish. St. Thomas Aquinas says, prudence deals with human goods about which we deliberate. Now to deliberate well seems to be the special work of the prudent man. In order to do this kind of deliberation, we need to set aside perhaps some time for that. I leave for you in the back of the, of the church some uh, resources in this regard. It's a blank schedule. I call it the St. Robert Bellarmine Schedule for Prayers and Works of Mercy. It goes from Sunday through Saturday, from 5 a.m. to the midnight hour. It's only a tool. Perhaps you already have some good schedules and planners and such. But if you don't, there is great value in thinking through your life. Some men go through months, and years, and decades of their life with the precious moments of their life slipping by, imprudently wasted, squandered on distractions and trivialities, without actually robustly taking into hand the work of prudence to determine what good he must be seeking and when and, and how he will pursue it. There was a study done for little children school children, as uh, our culture likes to experiment with school children, they did this experiment on them preparing for an exam. And they separated out into three groups, maybe four at that. One, this whatever they wanted to do as they were inclined, a kind of control group. Another then that uh, would make a resolution. A third group that was required to write down their resolution when it came to studying and preparing for the exam. And a fourth group yet that wrote it down and shared their resolution with a friend. And not surprisingly, even adjusting for differences of native intellect in the preparation for the exam, the results of it were such that those who did least well were those who had no particular resolution. Better still to make a resolution, better still than that, writing it down. And the optimal response, the optimal efficiency, fruitfulness, effectiveness, then was with those who wrote down their resolution and shared it with another. Children of the world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. Though we can take a page from the religious who have a role of life. We can expect that if a man goes into a monastery, a young woman goes to the convent, they go and pray a lot. But practically, they have a role of life, an orarium, a time to pray lauds and vespers, a specific time they're required to be in the chapel for meditation. The fruitfulness of that consecrated life the intensity of that prayer is rarely done by merely haphazard throwing them into a holy place and expecting holy results. It's by discipline, by consideration, by many elements of prudence. Now in the midst of the world, there are different requirements and possibilities and different distractions and impediments to a regularly ordered schedule. 
but at least it's good to know what a kind of default schedule would be and to aspire after what would be a splendid version of living out a disciplined life. If we only vaguely want to pray more, if we only have this nagging sense or a good guardian angel that we could do more in works of charity, we could order things somewhat better, but we don't actually take steps to remedy it, then we're held accountable before God. We're missing out on a kind of fruitfulness in life. Of course, in the midst of the world, there's need for much flexibility. But as far as a tool, an opportunity, I leave that to you as uh, hopefully helpful for some to consider a, a very practical effect of this conference, a very particular fruit you could seek to, to gain from this, a consideration of what would work better in your spiritual life. Further on with St. Thomas Aquinas and the parts of prudence, he would expect that we would have in our memory of what worked in the past, and so we would look to the future about what would be effective then. More than just the farsightedness, though, about planning ahead for one project or another, is looking to eternity. Again, in sacred scripture, in the wisdom literature, this time in the uh, book of Sirach, it says, In all thy works remember thy last end, and thou shalt never sin. Keep in mind your last end, the purpose of your prudence, not merely choosing the good for this or that thing, but ultimately unto a path that leads to eternal life. In all thy works, remember thy last end, and thou shalt never sin. With all thy fear, my soul, fear the Lord. Oh yes, that's another one I like. With all thy soul, fear the Lord, and reverence his priests. Honor God with all thy soul, and give honor to the priests, and purify thyself with thy arms. Give them their portion, as it is commanded thee, for the first fruits and of purifications, and for thy negligences purify thyself. So in order to live out prudence well, we're looking beyond this world to eternal life. Now, in the functioning of prudence, we are set up to be in need one to another. As much as we can try to come up with the best ways of doing things, we are doomed to fall short on our own. St. Catherine of Siena was given this explanation of why this would be so. God the Father explained these things to her. He says, there are the virtues and many others, too many to enumerate, which are brought forth in the love of neighbor. But although I have given them in such a different way, that is to say, not all to one, but to one, one virtue, and to another, another, it so happens that it is impossible to have one without having them all, because all the virtues are bound together. It's a little bit long here, but bear with me. It's a fascinating explanation of how God sets up the world and human community in each individual so as to be in need of one another. He says, Wherefore learn that in many cases I give one virtue to be, as it were, the chief of the others. That is to say, to one I will give principally love, to another justice, to another humility, to one a lively faith, to another prudence, or temperance, or patience, to another fortitude. These and many other virtues I place indifferently in the souls of many creatures. It happens, therefore, that the, the particular one so placed in the soul becomes the principal object of its virtue, the soul disposing herself for her chief conversation to this rather than to other virtues. And by the effect of this virtue, the soul draws to herself all the other virtues, which, as has been said, are all bound together in the affection of love. And so with many gifts and graces and virtue, 
and not only in the case of spiritual things, but also of temple. I use the word temple or the things necessary to the physical life of man. All these I have given indifferently, and I have not placed them all in one soul, in order that man should therefore have material for love of his fellow. I could have easily created men possessed of all that they should need, both for his body and soul, but I wish that one should have need of the other, and that they should be my ministers to administer the graces and the gifts that they have received from me. So God creates us to be interdependent in virtue. To one, he, he might give especially a courage, a robust fortitude, but he might need to rely upon his friend who has prudence. And the prudent man might need to learn from the one who has courage. And so God makes us so that we do need one another and to learn from one another. Sometimes prudence is used in a way that is a, a kind of um, excuse, an exculpation for cowardice. So we hold back from the truth. Some would suppose it would be imprudent in our times and sensitivities to speak boldly of the scourge of Islam or to denounce vaccines made from aborted babies or to call out the confusions and errors and manipulations of, uh, of the media in so many ways in our time. But that wouldn't be true prudence. When prudence does dictate a action should be taken, it may require, in fact, great courage to enact that decision. Prudence in the original Latin comes from providence, seeing forward. And we think of the divine providence. And indeed, God has the ultimate prudence, the ultimate providence, divine providence. Father Kassad says, the supernatural virtue, the supernatural prudence of the divine spirit, the principle of these attractions, infallibly attains its end. And the precise circumstances of each event are so applied to the soul without its perception that everything opposed to them cannot fail to be destroyed. And so we recall how St. Paul speaks. God makes all things work together for the good for those who love him. That doesn't mean we should go about with folly, with ignorance, with uh, imprudence, figuring that God will make it better. But in fact, we are called in exercising our minds, using our reason to use prudence for, the, uh, for cooperating with God's will, with discerning it and putting it into practice. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. This from the book of Proverbs. The vexation of a fool was known at once, but the prudent man ignores an insult. As St. Thomas Aquinas said that we must diligently apply ourselves to gain with docility prudential considerations to apply them to our lives. I'd recommend in a particular way the book of Proverbs. In our times, because of the pride of contemporary man, it's practically ignored. It seems so quaint and distant. I assure you, if you would attend carefully, regularly to reading through the Proverbs, calling upon the light of the Holy Spirit, you will find many truths that will guide you to avoid the folly of our times. Prudence is the capacity of the intellect to apprehend the good things of eternity and the means of attaining them. Wanted to consider then 
who has exercised prudence in particular? First of all, let us consider our Blessed Mother as the Virgin Most Prudent. Venerable Mary of Agreda speaks of our Blessed Mother in the perfection of her prudence, and I think this will help the points made so far to come alive, to consider them in their perfection in the Immaculate Heart of our Blessed Mother, the Eternal Queen of Heaven. Blessed Mary, Venerable Mary of Agreda describes in her City of God that Mary divided her time and applied it with rare prudence so as to give to each of her actions and occupations its proper share. She read much in the sacred writings of the ancients, and by means of her infused science, she was so well versed in them and in all their profound mysteries that none of them was unfamiliar to her. For the Most High made known to her all their mysteries and sacraments. She treated and conversed about them in her conferences with the holy angels of her guard, familiarizing herself with them and asking about them with incomparable intelligence and great acuteness. If this sovereign mistress had written what she understood, we would have many other additions to the sacred scriptures, and we would be able to draw out of them a perfect understanding of those writings and of the deep meanings and mysteries of all those preserved in the church. Again, in another place, Venerable Mary says of our Blessed Mother Mary, the humility of her behavior enhanced the prudence and aptness of her words. For the performance of these last duties in the temple, for on all occasions she spoke in few and weighty words. Our Blessed Mother is most prudent and yet looks upon us not only in this, her life but throughout the life of the church. In another, in the time the feast day we celebrate St. Dominic, our Blessed Mother appeared and taught him the rosary to enhance his preaching and gave that sound counsel which informed his prudence about how to fight against heresies. Now, we only know about this, we mostly know about this, from Blessed Alan de la Roche. Blessed Alan was a 15th century Dominican. This Blessed Roche had a great reverence for sacred traditions, for traditions of piety, for devotion, and faithfully passed these on. So let's pray for the intercession of Blessed Roach, for anyone with that name. Uh, he even describes that uh, our Blessed Mother, how our Blessed Mother appeared to St. Dominic giving the rosary, and St. Dominic himself appeared to Blessed Alan and described the, uh, how he so effectively preached the rosary in his time. Furthermore, we have today St. John Vianney. Pope St. John XXIII wrote about St. John Vianney, and he gave this principle of, uh, of prudence for priests, who may especially for our priests here. Pope St. John XXIII writes in his letter on St. John Vianney, almost everyone knows St. John Vianney's answer to the priests who complained to him that his apostolic zeal was bearing no fruit. You have offered humble prayers to God. You have wept, you have groaned, you have sighed. Have you added fasts, vigils, sleeping on the floor, castigation of your body? Until you have done all of these, do not think that you have tried everything. Pope St. John the 23rd says, once again, our minds our mind turns to sacred ministers who have the care of souls, and we urgently beg them to realize the importance of these words. Let each one think over his own life in the light of the supernatural prudence that should govern all our actions, and ask himself if it is really all that the pastoral care of the people 
and trusted to him requires. Such is the prudence of the saints, going well beyond the, the minimum up to the utmost of pure dedication and conformity to Christ in loving, praying for, attaining the graces of conversion for his people. Finally, let's think on prudence in its relationship to joy. The virtues are what activate a man to make him fully alive. That should be a pleasant thing, a happy thing. It is not so much the, the burden of the work that prudence may demand of us, but the assurance that by acting with prudence, informed by, by prayer and discernment, we are on our way to heaven. And as St. Teresa of Avila says, all of the way to heaven is heaven. St. John Paul II spoke about this problem of, uh, of prudence that would be apart from joy. Let theologians always remember the words of that great master of thought and spirituality, St. Bonaventure, who in introducing his Itinerario Mentis and Deum, invites the reader to recognize the inadequacy of reading without repentance, knowledge without devotion, research without the impulse of wonder, prudence without the ability to surrender to joy. Action divorced from religion, learning sundered from love, intelligence without humility, study unsustained by divine grace, thought without the wisdom inspired by God. One loves righteousness. Her labors are virtues. For she teaches self-control and prudence, justice and courage. Nothing in life is more profitable for men than these. The world would promise the false, deceptive pleasures of the flesh. Lust would especially impede the functioning of prudence. It blinds the eye, and the eye is as the symbol of prudence. When we can see clearly with the eyes of prudence, we can determine what we should do, what path we should take. Oh, I wanted to mention one word on prudence and life, the beginnings of life. I'm going to give about five more minutes. We started about ten minutes late, so I have a few more minutes to go. Um, Regarding the openness to life. In my home parish some years ago, we had a uh, pilgrim virgin statue of Our Lady of Fatima carried around from one house to another. And I was talking with a lady who was a mother of seven children. And she said she went to see this pilgrim statue of Our Lady of Fatima. And she was told that Our Lady had a smile on her face. And it was a very encouraging sort of thing. She wanted to go see Our Lady's smile and was expecting to see it. So much so a skeptic would say she was simply expecting to see what was surely going to be what she would, how she would perceive the statue. Instead, though, when she came into the room and saw Our Lady, Our Blessed Mother had to her the most profound expression of sorrow that struck her to her heart and brought her to the deepest sorrow she had ever known in her life. And she still pondered why Our Lady would have such sorrow. Yet in that same conversation, the Lady had told me, although that she had seven children, she would have no more. She would cut off that. She would refuse any more children because it was impractical. She didn't have enough support. And so Our Lady would sensibly, would weep, would have tears, sorrow for, for the the parents who would refuse the gift of children. So much is said about family planning nowadays, but we forget the working of divine providence and the ultimate good of a child whose destination is eternal life. Sister Lucia Fatima writes of her village and the families there. 
Their homes had been blessed by the sacrament of matrimony, and their conjugal fidelity was absolute. They welcomed all the children God chose to send them, not as a burden, but as another gift with which God was enriching their homes, another life to prolong their own into the future, another flower to bloom in their garden, filling with the perfume and the joy of the many scents and shades of fresh smiling youth, another soul entrusted by God to their care, so that by guiding it in the ways of heaven, it could become yet another member of the mystical body of Christ, yet another hymn of praise to eternal glory. So as we make our considerations and prudence, let us live out our vocations with generosity and intensity, open to the workings of divine providence and, uh, and the considerations of prudence of finding the help and structures of support that may be needed. As a chaplain for nursing homes, let me say but a word on the importance of prudence in the face of death. Do not delay if you or a relative are in hospice care to seek the, the sacrament of anointing of the sick. Do not delay when a loved one is dying to call a priest. Some people love when it's so dramatic, when the priest comes at that last second just to impart the, the apostolic pardon and say, go forth, Christian soul. It's a dramatic thing, but in the practicalities and pressures of the lives of priests nowadays, help them in their prudence, give them fair opportunity by calling promptly. It's an important principle of prudence. It could save a soul if you are reasonably prompt in informing your priest about any need for the last rites in the sacraments of the church. It's not as much of a need right now, but one day you shall die. Keep in mind your last end and you shall never sin, and be aware at the end, well, keep your soul in the state of grace by living out of sacramental life, but seek the help of the church receive viaticum and be prepared to come before the judgment's seat of Christ. And so let us pray to our Blessed Mother for the virtue of prudence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Virgin most prudent, pray for us. Saint Joseph most prudent, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.